ready to rock and roll. Hey, Warners, welcome to another episode of The Women Your Mother Warns You About, brought to you by Sales Gravy. And this is a really good time to be taking advantage of salesgravy.university. Go check that out. I am Gina Schmarco, Master Sales Trainer and Coach with Sales Gravy. And I am Susanna Gray, owner of Chime Search and Recruitment Strategist. (laughs) (laughs) They love it. Chime. Makes me sound like a right geek, doesn't it? Strategist. It does. You need like a bell where you hit the chime. Like a yeah, chime. yeah. Ka-ching. Yeah. Ching. How are you doing? You good? I'm doing so good today. You know when you just have those days where you just wake up and you think, I'm good. And even like I've been really paying attention to what I've been eating, but I've also been paying attention to like I'm not, I'm not saying I'm eating healthily, but I'm thinking about the mind food. You know, I've been looking into that a lot. Food that's good for the mind and the soul. Ooh, yeah. You know what you got to read? Have I, have you, are you familiar with the book Game Changers? No, but I love a good book. Ooh, you got to check out Game Chain, Game Changers by David Asprey. Nice. Um, he divides the book up into like the three most important things for productivity. And one is about what you put in your body, right? So like food. He he's also the founder of we've talked about it on the show quite a bit. Um, actually, Rachel and I did an episode about it, episode 35. And I, I remember this because it was one of our funniest episodes because we talk about bees having sex and that's how we got into the whole episode. But um, David Asprey is also the founder of Bulletproof Coffee. A lot of people are familiar with that and, and buy his products, but he talks about what to put into your body and how important that is on productivity. It's so interesting. And most people don't drink enough water as well. There's that. Yep. But um, but with that, I've also been trying to do a bit of rebranding and I've been looking at um, inspirational quotes kind of on a day-to-day basis to kind of lift myself up and lift my followers up. And one of the ones that came up that got the most likes was one that you, you were particularly fond of. And Ooh, what was that? I, I do I do hit like on everything you post. I, I try. <laughs> I appreciate that. And ditto. And if I don't, give me a slap. But anyway, <laughs> so the um the quote was from Cinderella. Do you remember? I can't remember. It's what Cinderella's mum used to say to her but before she passed away. And that was have courage and be kind. It's on my LinkedIn and I just think it's so, so, so good. So simple. Yeah. Have courage and be kind. Sometimes those could be hard. Yeah. One thing that I must say, actually, when I think of you, I think I would say I always think of you as a courageous person. Ah, it, it, it kind of got me thinking about sales because mm-hmm. I think you've got many different attributes to your personality that makes you a good salesperson, right? And I would say courage is probably a key one from an outsider Mm -hmm. that makes you a good salesperson. And I want to know what your self-reflection take on that is. I'll I'll give you that, but I want to know what what your definition of courage is. Like, how how do you see courage in sales? Okay, three things. I think, first of all, fear management, right? So being able to manage your fear, that's the amygdala part of the brain that Mm -hmm, automatically mm -hmm. kicks in when we're scared. So I think, first of all, fear management in sales. And an example of that might be rejection, Mm -hmm. overcoming. I hate overcoming, we say managing objections. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And also getting over the fear of someone not liking you. You know, there's Mm -hmm. still that fear of picking up the phone and cold calling. No one wants to do it. We talk about it all the time. Mm -hmm. And also the ability to change direction. Okay. That takes courage. So say if you're going on a meeting and it's not going in the right direction, you need to steer it the other way and you've got mm-hmm. a strong personality. And the third thing is something that you talk about a lot. And that is the courage to be creative. Mm, yeah. I love it. I love it. I've thought about this a lot. <laughs> I can tell you've got a plan and I'm going to improvise this one. <laughs> um, when I think of courage um, from a self-reflection standpoint, mm-hmm. right, we're, we're, we're naturally risk adverse, right? Mm-hmm. Like we, uh, everything comes down to fear, right? W- why we don't do a lot of things. Everything comes to fear of mm-hmm. something. And having courage 
means we have to do something that might be out of our comfort zone Mm -hmm. that might make us vulnerable um, that shows our weakness Mm -hmm. and stepping out of that and not worrying about what other people think or not worrying about failing, right? Mm -hmm. That that's where courage comes in, in, in my opinion. I, this is brilliant, brilliant definition. And I would agree with that. I think, you know what I really want, like, and what I would like to say to my children is we've all been in a room, right? Where someone is made to feel a bit inferior or Mm -hmm. they're made to feel a bit stupid. Or I think back to school when people used to bully this one girl who, she was lovely. I have no idea why people were mean to her. She probably didn't look right. She probably didn't smell right. She probably wasn't very smart. I can't remember what it was, but she was teased. And I always think back to it and I think, why? Why didn't I just stand there, go and sit by her and just be her friend? Why was I scared? I, it haunts me to this very day. And I, I, I really hope that I can install into my kids the ability to stand up against what is wrong and to not do what's easy. We all want to take the easy way out. And that could be socially or sometimes in, in business. Yeah, because, you know, there's bullies. You're talking about bullies of, with kids, but there's also, I don't want to, it's not just about bullies in, in business, but you want to, uh, you want to be accepted and included in business. And if you're the person who, makes a decision that's not popular that goes against the status quo. Mm -hmm. I think I, I think I talked about that in the 200th episode of this show. I'm Mm -hmm. so sorry you weren't there, but I, I I talked about this when it comes to social media of, you know, you can pass when it comes to posting things on, in social media, you, you have to make a decision and be intentional of like, Am I going to post these things because I'm going to be judged? If I post something sad, I'm going to be judged. If I post something happy about my life, I'm going to be judged. Um, I'm going to be judged no matter what. That That's just how we are as humans. Or I could just be all status quo every day and, you know, post pictures of my sunrise every morning and just that, that, which which I do do. But that would my my sunrises to me that I post pictures of are more a status quo in my opinion it's mm. like here's a here's a pretty picture mm. i'm not making a statement i'm not taking a stand i'm not having an opinion i'm just posting a pretty picture and that's and that to me is status quo and not having a voice yeah i by the way about your last episode um i i heard that bit and and i completely appreciated what you said about posting um, on, on social media, it's a big kind of, it's the way we, we put ourselves out there to the world, right? Mm-hmm. And you mentioned something in the episode about playing it. Everyone, we all want to stick to that status quo and, and play it safe. And it's too, it's very easy, easy to do that. And it got me thinking about leadership in a big way mm-hmm. about people that we coach, sales managers, people who come into the role. And they want to be liked. They want to fit to that status quo. So my question for you would Mm. be, and I think this is interesting and very relevant to sales leaders, how can a sales leader show courage? Mm. What advice have you got for, this is a Susanna listener question, Gina, (laughs) Tramarco, Nalda. How can can a leader, how can a leader show courage, um, especially a new leader? who maybe hasn't developed that self-resilience yet. Yeah, so what comes to mind really fast when you say, how can a leader show courage? I think there's a couple things with that. I think courage goes hand in hand with vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're a new leader. Now, I actually am coaching someone who's a new leader Mm -hmm. and I'm not sharing all the details of someone, but this is kind of an overview of the personality. He's a new leader. And he is, his personality style is that of the wanting to make everybody happy. Mm -hmm. And so his big challenge right now is, you know, owning the space of being the new leader Mm -hmm. and having to 
make decisions and lead and still have everybody love him. Mm. Right. And so he was promoted. So that's a challenge because he's been put in this new role amongst his peers. And he's so, you know, worried about people being happy. So that's part of it. And and the other part of it, the vulner besides the vulnerability, is believing in yourself. Mm-hmm. Because we all suffer with sometimes not having confidence, sometimes feeling imposter syndrome. We talk about this a lot. And believing in yourself that you can do the job. I think that's probably if I had to pick something, it would be believing in yourself that you can do the job and to stop listening to the negative talk in your head about I'm not qualified for this. How do I do this? Are they going to trust me? Are they going to? That would be it. Believe in yourself. I think a lot of leaders with their teams, they can see that they're on a stage. They often think they're on a sta- stage and the audience needs to love them. Not that the audience wants them to actually carry them with mm-hmm. courage. <laughs> There's that love and carry and courage. And I think um, for me, one thing that comes really to mind with what you're saying is courage with communication. Because I, when I think of when I've been the most scared as a leader is having the conversations that I don't want to have. And it didn't matter how much experience I had, how many years that I did it, I would still struggle to get to sleep some nights because I naturally love people. I love most people in the world. And sometimes you have to have that conversation and someone is not going to love you as a result of that. Especially, there are many yes people out there. You mentioned imposter syndrome. And I think that's really a huge thing. Someone asked me the other day, I'm a people pleaser. What Mm -hmm. do I do to show courage as a leader when I know that my people aren't going to be happy and I've got to communicate something that they do not want? And how am I going to do that? And I want to know what your advice is on this. But my first bit of advice to them was the way that you communicate it, right? There's been something on the news recently in the UK about Mm -hmm. a ferry company who just literally did a pre-recorded Zoom to all of his employees, thousands of employees to let them go, right? Pre-recorded. It wasn't even there. It wasn't even there live. It was like a pre-recorded thing and it just, they pressed play. There was no one to talk to them afterwards. It was just off you go type thing. Very cowardly. That is cowardly. There There is no courage in that. That's, that is a sucky way to communicate. This is so, that is horrible. Yeah. Yeah. And I think people see right through that, right? It's, this is what you said as well about admitting sometimes that you're wrong as a leader, showing vulnerability. That to me is more courageous than someone who is untouchable and can never make a mistake. Yeah. I think that's a touchy one as a leader to, I think it's important to admit when you made a mistake and at Mm -hmm. the same time, it's risky, right? Some people are going to lean into that and be like, okay, great. You're not perfect. Awesome. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, people could lose faith in you, Mm -hmm. right? If you, if you made some kind of mistake and once they've formed their opinion or of, of you, of that decision of yours, um, you may or may not, you know, lose their allegiance to you. So I I think that's a tough one, Um, but I would, I would always lean towards take the harder road. You know, there's that phrase, I don't know if you have it in the US, but it's like the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. I think that's really relevant in this conversation because there's that blind spot, that thing that people don't want to talk about that's making people negative and groups are going off on their own at lunchtime. It could be a way that someone manages or the attitude they have to to their team. And you've got two types of managers. You've got the one manager who says, guys, we're going to talk about this. They're not going to be told off, but going to talk about understanding how you feel. Mm -hmm. And you've got the other manager who says, well, if you guys don't like it, that's just the way I am. You deal with it. And that second manager is one that never brings people with them. Mm -hmm. And they lack courage. Sadly, there are way too many managers like this in the world. And I think 
courage. Well, there's a lot. I think there's a lot of humans like that. It's not just managers. Like I had an instant flashback to to um, someone in my previous life, not my current life. I'll just leave it at that. Uh, protect the innocent. I mean, protect the guilty. Um, that was something he used to say to me all the time. This is how I am, and I'm never changing. And I think my response to him was, "Well, he's like you. You know these things about me, and." Um, you know, you should just accept I'm never changing. And I'm like, well, that's pretty sad because I'm always trying to to be better. I'm always trying to look at how can I improve. And that comment to me was very status quo of him. Like, this is what it is. I'm like, well, this relationship is not going to work out if we're going to stay in that place of not being willing to work through it. And so much of leadership is about managing the dynamics of multiple relationships. Mm. There's that, you know, how things go into fashion and leadership training. There there was that big thing about five years ago, and it's still a very current model about the win-win or the win-lose. And it should always be a win-win. You should never have to compromise, even if you're the employee and the boss or even the co-worker. Because let's face it, courage applies to co-workers too, Mm -hmm. especially in companies where we often talk about how there can be like a terrorist in the workplace. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Often someone who's underperforming, um, not making money, and they're feeling very negative strong personality and they bring other people with them that's difficult right Mm -hmm. because for a leader you could be losing lots of people but it's also difficult that person to admit to themselves have courage to themselves i'm not performing and i need to go there's so many elements of courage that can only grow through communication well it's interesting you you bring that up I, i think about um actually my my first leadership position many years ago when I was leading a fairly decent sized team, it was 50 people. And of course there were a large publicly traded company. And I, you know, I know this would be shocking. I was the personality who always spoke my mind on things. And no, I know it's, it's really no hard. Way. I know, I know. <laughs> I'm very, I'm very quiet and timid. <laughs> and and what would happen? Because I I recall being on these um, on these company calls with like the other leaders from the other cities, and I would be getting messages that are like, "Hey, thanks for bringing that up. I'm so happy you said that. You know, this has been on my mind." And, and so people would come back to me and say, well, "You know what? I I love that you bring up the things that I I want to bring up, but I'm afraid to bring up." Mm-hmm. Right. But that also made me look like, you know, the rebel rouser, the troublemaker, the oh, Gina's going to bring that up. But I was bringing up things that were valid concerns for everybody, but everybody was afraid to bring them up. Right. So you're going to have that guy or girl who is going to be willing to do that, but then be seen as creating mm-hmm. a riff. So then it's like. But I would challenge that. I would challenge that. I wouldn't challenge you. Right. I wouldn't challenge you because I know you're not like this, but I've had situations where people have come to me in teams and this is when I was a lot younger and they've been sort of trying to speak up about things that they're not happy about. And it would sometimes bring people who maybe didn't have the issue. It would then make them have the issue. And I remember once my boss said to me at the time, she said to me, Susanna, next time someone says something to you about management, that might be true. Ask yourself why are they why are they talking to me about this? What mm-hmm. how how are they trying to make me feel positive? How are they trying to make you feel positive by mm-hmm. bringing up those issues and tell them to next time speak to me, the manager? And I thought that was true. Yeah, but um, some managers you can't speak to. Yeah, it depends on it depends on what you're bringing up. You know, I'm I'm thinking I'm thinking about topics where I don't want to reveal the company. I'm bringing up things that were relevant to the operation of our business is mm-hmm. right because we were all individual business units mm-hmm. following some uniformity of how we were doing things mm-hmm. that was actually creating God, I don't know, <laughs> that was actually potentially creating issues that could be legally troubling let's just put it that way like it was the best thing the best way I can say it where I was I was bringing up something that was a 
a true concern and elephant in the room that everybody was ignoring. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't mm -hmm. trying to stir it up, but, but everybody needed to know how to operationally take care of something. Let's just leave it at that. And, and I knew there would be tension mm -hmm. around it. Well, it's bringing up the elephant in the room and sometimes that needs to be done. I guess it's how, how it's done. And, and I'm sure you didn't do it in a negative way. I think a lot of the time it's, it's yeah. what's the intention behind bring, bringing that, bringing that up. But I think uh, another thing that kind of comes, comes to my mind. And especially with leaders, is I think trust takes courage. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think trust, like this whole working from home thing that everyone's talking about at the moment, because I'm in recruitment. I have people saying, I want to leave my job because they won't let me work from home. And then sometimes I speak to managers and they say, We're not letting them work from home because they won't work from home. And I think, Well, no, they won't. Not if they feel that they're not trusted. But if they had the courage to say, Then hire we the right people. In you guys. I mean, like, Hire hire people that that you can trust to work from home. It's a new world now for us to work from home. Like if if you can't allow your yeah. now some jobs you can't allow that, but if you can allow that, back before sales gravy, I had a client that you know when when COVID hit, they gave up when when they were coming out of it. They ended up giving up seventy five percent of their office space, and they had a huge amount of office space. And they sent all their employees to permanently work at home and it worked out for them, right? It's like, it's a new world. You just have to put systems in place for that and then trust it. So you're right. I think it takes courage. I also think it takes courage in a sales conversations. I found myself in this situation the other day. There are times where I will... I know what I'm supposed to be doing to turn around objections, but there are moments where sometimes I don't always turn them around and I let the sale walk away. Right. I, I ad, mm. admittingly, right. I'll, I'll let it, I'll let it walk away sometimes for good reasons. I let one walk away the other day because it just wasn't a good fit and I knew it wasn't going to be a good fit. Mm -hmm. It was actually, I'm not going to go into all the details. I knew it wasn't going to be a good fit for, for any of us to take on. I, I don't want to walk away from money. But it was just one of those I didn't, I just didn't feel it was the right fit so I could walk away. But there have been times where I've walked away where I should have just been more confident, been a trusted advisor and turned around the objection. Uh, and this happened the other day where, right, great rapport, great connection, um, good fit. Uh, I asked all the right questions. I didn't even have to ask a lot of questions. Good discovery, got them talking. And then he says, right. And then we talk, we finally get to the elephant in the room and price and I shut up and I wait. <laughs> She's so good at this for those people listening. <laughs> and I wait. So I, I've, I've witnessed it. And I let time go. And then I go, how does that feel? I don't know why that's my question, but that's always my question. How does, how does that feel? It feels expensive. I go, Okay. So what do you want to do? And he's like, well, um, all right, well, can you, can you send me, can you send me the information? And I was about to walk away. I could feel it. I could feel it in my system. It was the end of the day. I'm not always great at the end of the day. I know this about me. And I'm like, and I just leaned in and I said, I just gave you the information. Why do you need me to send it to you? You have all the information that you need. And he just, he looked at me and he goes, you're right. Okay, let's do this. No way. Yeah. And I've done Seriously? that. Seriously? <laughs> yes. Seriously? See, I don't know if I'd have the courage to do that. Well, that's what I say. I think I think I would just say, I'll send you the information and then get a micro commitment. Yeah. But I'm. Do you know what I'm thinking in my head? I'm thinking that shows courage. That well, that can that, everyone do that when you, you get when you the brought script. when you brought up courage as a topic. That was the first thing that came to my mind because I remember feeling really uncomfortable on that. I was like, I know he wants to do this. I know it's the right fit. I know we can help him. This was a coaching thing. I'm like, all the things are right here. We're, this is totally the right thing, and we are the right thing. And I'm like. 
don't let him walk away. Like the inside voice was like, just, and, and this is not even a, a, an objection turnaround that I, I have scripted and, you know, ready in my pocket. Like we teach, I was just in the moment. What helped me in the moment was not rushing it, being quiet, sitting there and taking my time. And really it was my inside voice that came out. My inside voice was like, why do I need to send you information? I just gave you all the information. Like that was my inside voice. That was my unfiltered voice. I didn't let the unfiltered come out right away. But it made sense when it did come out. I'm like, do you know what? I, you, you're right. So I'm just thinking about you. Because I'm thinking if you told someone to script that, I'm not sure it would work. I think it is that unfiltered. That you you do have this um, sometimes lack like of filter. But because it comes out so genuinely... It, it kind of works. I think you get away with saying things that maybe some people couldn't. So with that in mind, to our <laughs> listeners who are thinking they want to show courage in this kind of sales conversation, what kind of what kind of advice would you give them? Oh, I was just at, I, they're not they they aren't Gina Tramarca Clouder, right? Well, they it's, are. It's it's funny that you um that you asked that question because I had a feeling you were going to ask that question. Of course. Because like you said, I, I didn't plan for it. I didn't know I was going to say that. I didn't have it scripted. Um, I have other objection turnarounds scripted. That one I did not. What helps me is reminding myself to not respond right away. Mm -hmm. That's what helps me. Yes, because if you were to respond immediately, maybe you wouldn't have the courage. Is that what what you're saying? You wouldn't have the courage to answer. Well, maybe well, it's, it's maybe it's, emotional control. Yeah, I was going to say, maybe it is a version of what we talk about at Sales Gravy with ledge disrupt. Yeah, it's a silent ledge. I I think so. It's a silent ledge. So instead of saying anything, I say nothing until I get a hold of my emotions and then the fil then the thought that comes to my head that I that that I want to spit out. I'm like, can I spit this out unfiltered and let it be okay? Mm -hmm. And I don't think too long about it. But I think it's because I take a beat and I and I take a beat to breathe mm -hmm. before I respond. So I would call it a silent ledge. I'm just like, let me just take a beat because I, I would teach this in improv all the time on stage to my performers when they would get a suggestion from the audience they and they didn't know what to create and they would be stuck in how yeah. do I, how do I create something? I, my, my first piece of advice was don't do anything. Mm -hmm. Just sit in the silence because when you sit in the silence, the audience leans in physically. They physically lean in to make sure. Yeah. Like, that, yeah. Like you're doing on camera. They're, they're leaning in because they feel like they, they, did she talk? Did I miss something? Because the silence is indicate like we're so used to people talk, 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 talk. And it's the silence that gets their attention. That would be my biggest piece of advice is, is just take a beat and be silent. Yeah. And, and then and then and then don't don't cancel out what's coming up in your intuition. Right. Like don't cancel out the thing that is coming to your head right away unless it's something like you're a jerk. Like, don't say that out loud. Um, but, but, but for me, what came up was, why do I need to send you information? I, I just gave you all the information. Do you want to do this or not? Yeah. You see, I think about it a bit like a Pepsi Max bottle, right? So if you just think in a sales conversation, all these things are put out there, which is like the bottle shaking, shaking, fizzing, fizzing, fizzing to the top. And you've got a choice. Either you open that Pepsi Max bottle and you come out, the amygdala goes into play and you act scared, nervous, you don't show courage or maybe in a boss situation with a sales team that they will look, they will be irrational or with colleagues, you might be emotional to your bosses, you know, all those things. And just like you said, you take that moment, what would you do with the Pepsi Max bottle? You would open it really slowly. <laughs> you would wait to see first whether the bubbles had had gone down, you would acknowledge that they had been there, but you would wait until, I mean, oh, I'm loving this Pepsi Max um, analogy <laughs> I that I'm going with. I you. don't even know what Pepsi Max is, but I love it. Coca-Cola. 
This is it. Do you know? You know? You know I'm saying you guys have Pepsi over we there. We have Pepsi, but we don't have Pepsi Max. You're not that weird in America. <laughs> you um, Pepsi. Pepsi Max is like I think it's like the Max. It's ca- like Cappy. It's like Coke Light. No, I think it's the opposite. I think it's like Max. Nothing lights about to it. The, to the Max. To the Max. No, I'm saying like I don't think we have Coke Light in America, but I think there's Coke Light in Mexico. That's that was my. Uh, Ah, <laughs> yeah, that's one thing I learned actually about America when I came to see you last. It was how differently all the states are with the laws, with the, mm-hmm. the how they do, with even driving and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. It's mad. It's yeah. like it's almost like many countries within. Ah, yeah. oh, very, uh, much, very things. much so. I I think like going back to the whole courage thing. One thing that 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 came to my mind, especially in leadership, if if we're going with leadership, is people who orders, you, you know, the, the kind of sense of giving orders and the power. Um, to me, they think they're being courageous when they're giving out orders and being very powerful and being very, what's the word, dictatorial, mm-hmm. um, autocratic. Like, I think that's what some people perceive to be courage and they go with that. The minute they're a leader, mm-hmm. I'm going to be that leader. But actually, as someone who's had leaders and the leader that I would want to be, should I go back into leadership, would be trusting, admitting I don't always have the answers. Mm-hmm. And seeing that you, I don't always know. And with that, something that you always talk about, meditation. Like, I think that plays a part in it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I do, because to have, to have courage... You have to have some level of reflection to have courage to do something out of your comfort zone. I, I think in, in many situations you're going to think, of, I was going to say, you're going to think about it ahead of time. But I, I think there's a lot of m- courageous moments where um, when there are, are, are emergencies or critical moments or, you know, when things happen and someone steps in to save the day, like literally, if you think about like first responders, like, it's their job to have courage. Well, some people have a natural impulse for that. And I don't think they can always be prepared. I'm going to tell you a story about a car that we, I have told you before, I almost lost my kids. Like we parked the car on a hill. I had one one-year-old and one two-year-old at the time and put the handbrake on. It was a newish car. Anyway, we, we went inside, we came back to the car, put the kids in the back. Suddenly car starts rolling down a steep hill. Oh, God. I would die. And do you know what my automatic response was? Try and hold on to the car. I mean, what the hell? It's a car. I can't hold the car back. My husband ran down the hill, opened the door, went straight in, put the car on, put the brake on. Like, that, he was amazing. That's why I'm still married to him because he... (laughs) No, but uh, seriously, like, the courage he showed in that situation, it was like an immediate courage courage response. uh, Well, let's talk about... There, there's another example. I mean, courage is also an emotional reaction stirred by the amygdala, right? Like courage is a, is often about life and death situations. Yes. You're, if you're, someone was to break into your house right now, mm-hmm. what would you do? I, c- I can't tell you because I don't if know. If you were on your own, what do you think? What do you, have you ever been in a situation um, like that? I've been in... I, well, I think I told you this story. I was, I, I'm not sure if I did or not, but I was in a situation where I was on a, I was on a blind date and the blind date was dropping me off at my house. And there was definitely not like a connection between us. So it was more like friendly. So there was no kissing in the car. Just to put that out there. It was like, let me go. I'm off. No, no, not, not even that. But we were just sitting in the car, like talking, like, you know, we were just, you know, how like you're, you're in conversation while you're driving and then you get to your destination and you're still talking. And so we were pulled up in front of my house doing that. And the next thing you know, all of a sudden out of nowhere, there were these two guys in hoodies, um, one on each side of the car at our windows, at our car windows with guns pointed at our heads. He had a gun at his what? head. He had a gun at his head. I had a gun at my head. And what what happened next? Whew. So it's going to be good when I write the book, oh, right? The little gosh. stories I forget about. I forgot about the story. I get out of you. I love it. So, so, they, so in my head in that moment where my 
you know, where my amygdala was going. Like I'm literally, like we're in front of my house. And the first thing mm. that came in my mind, because I'll never, you don't forget these moments when you're almost killed. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I've got my purse with me, with my license, with my address. And, 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 and if they get me out of this car, they're going to know where I live. They don't right now, they don't know I live in this house, but that was where my head was. And my date, like while I'm doing that, cause I'm like, what do I do with my wallet? That's what I was thinking. My date literally was get down. He yelled, get down. And he put his foot on the gas and he floored it out of there. He like, even though there's a car in front of us, I don't know how he, he got out of that parking space. He had such an instant reaction. He didn't think. He just went into action and started driving. How often, I mean, there, I think a lot of people would like, I was personally in not fight or flight. I was in freeze. I was in freeze mode. Paralysis. Yeah. I was in freeze mode and he ran us out of there. And I'll never forget that. Like he's, he saved my life. But you didn't marry him. <laughs> no, <laughs> <marry him. laughs> no, but I, I will say we, we went to the police station to file a report. We did that. And, and then after I was so sh shaken and I said to him, I go, I can't go back to my house. I was so freaked out. I'm like, so I can't, where did you, where did you I'm go? like, you're going to have to take me back to your house and let me sleep at your house. No, he planned all of this so he could get you into his bed. <laughs> that's why he knew. <laughs> no. Oh my gosh, no, but on a serious note, oh my gosh, that's so scary. Did you have any kind of post-traumatic like uh, reactions to that? No. No, I mean, I was a little, I mean, I was shaken, definitely. It, it was a... I think probably because they didn't know I lived there and maybe I didn't think about it. Um, no, I, I had, I've had more stress from my condo being broken into. This was a different house in Chicago. Someone broke into my condo and stole some things, including my computer and jewelry. And that was probably more unnerving and still impacts me. Because it was a scenario where I know we just went off on a crazy tangent. It was a scenario where so I add to this there. <laughs> you, you've been you've been violated, right? Someone's been in my home. Someone has been here. I don't know how they got in. There was no evidence of anyone breaking in. Mm. And maybe because it was new construction, somebody had a key. And kept a key. I don't remember if I changed the locks when I moved in. So I don't, they, there was no evidence of someone breaking in. And so that was a pretty scary experience thinking, how'd they get in here? Are they still in here? Can they get in here again? To this day, I really struggle with like, like when I first got divorced um, from the first husband, like living alone for a while was hard. Like that was. I see that. I see, that. and I, I, I feel like that too. I mean, I, I, I know I'm not living alone, but when my husband goes away, I have my cameras. One at the back, one at the yeah. front. Yeah. Some people think that's crazy, but what you just said about how you just went into that paralysis. Mm -hmm. The reason I brought it up is because I've got a friend who was burgled. She was in the bath at the time, Ooh. and she just got out and just screamed, "Get out of my house!" And I just thought that is so out of character for her. And it's just, I find the brain so fascinating when we're put in moments of complete vulnerability, how it will have an immediate reaction. And some people would say that was courageous. Some people would say it wasn't. But, you know, I think, um, I think understanding your reaction, knowing when you need to stop. Uh, can I just give one more example? When, say, I, I've coached someone who had a, had a very emotional reaction to their boss and doing something that they didn't like. And I, I told her to write the email first. Don't send it. Write the email first. And she did. And she felt much better about it. And sometimes it is just giving yourself that chance if you know you're going to react in a certain way. Well, there's something for sure here talking about courage. I, I think there are two forms of courage after having this conversation. There's the intentional, yeah. intentional courage. Right. Okay. I'm going to do this thing, even though you I don't. You always summarize it so well. Yes. 
I don't, I, I don't want to do this, but I, I have to do this because this is the position I'm in, especially if you're in a leadership position or like I was coaching one of my clients today who um, just closed a huge deal and it was the coolest thing to watch because I was observing this, this deal go down, right? Having the courage for him, right? We, we kind of planned it out of like, we prepared for it. We prepared for what we had to do. We prepared for his objection turnaround. We prepared for it. It was scary and uncomfortable, but we prepared for it. And that's intentional. Or you've got the fight or flight amygdala courage. Mm. The I got to I got to step in there in the moment and just do it. And maybe there's something in between, like I just talked about with the deal I closed of take a beat. I wasn't intending on this act of courage. But it mm. did feel kind of courageous when I was like, why do you want me to send you more information? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so that, that's how I see courage. Two, two types of courage, um, intentional and fight or flight courage. What, what say you to that as we, uh, I'm sure you've got a great end of podcast question for me. Uh, I do. And I, I just want to just agree with what you said about intentional and unintentional. And I think one thing that I learned from your example there in a sales meeting is to think, what are they trying to get me to do that will make it easy for them to walk away? How can I just take that beat that you said, just to maybe go with my instinct, but in an intentional way of emotional control that disrupts the expectation, but at the same time Mm. gets it over the line and closes it. Really well said. Very well said. Wow, we created that one together. There we go. Awesome. So I've got a question for you today. Okay. okay. Because you're the, you're essentially, we're, well, we're each other's guests, but this one's for you. And I know you've got to go to a sales meeting. So I want you to tell us something because we all know Gina as someone who is courageous and goes into those situations, appears confident, has presence. We, we know, we know all the great things that you put out onto our universe. What I want to know, if you feel comfortable, because we tell secrets in that podcast. Oh, gosh, I'm, I'm scared. I want to know, what, 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 do, what is your biggest fear? What keeps you up at night? And if you've got a few that come to mind and one that you feel a bit uncomfortable saying out here in the public, um, use maybe one that you feel a bit more comfortable with. But what, 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 what is your biggest fear? Oh, my gosh. My biggest fear. Oh, I think you've. I think you have me stumped. Okay. 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 Um, Any kind of harm to me is my biggest fear. And if, if I were to drill that down, I would drill it down to like, obviously someone breaking into my home or doing something like, you know, hijacking me in my car or something like that. Mm. Um, That's probably one of my biggest fears or psychological harm because it's happened to me before. Um, where, um, uh, there was a con artist that really financially and, and psychologically did a number on me and, um, and it was bad. So that kind of scenario, that's a whole nother story to tell at another time of feeling stupid Mm. and feeling like an idiot. Maybe that's it. Maybe it's the fear of being stupid. Which goes hand, I guess, I guess hand in hand with imposter syndrome too. But um, the fact that I got duped by someone like that, that really messed me up. Um, and I got through it because it taught me a lot about obstacle immunity. But I would say that would that would be a fear of of that ever happening me, to me again. And what about you? I I think mine will be honestly my integrity being questioned and uh, this has mm. happened to me actually it was a client who I, I recruited for who sent me an email accusing me of trying to headhunt from them when um I hadn't any said if I hadn't known about it I wouldn't do that they're my client anyway um when I when I got that accusation um I asked for more information because I was really confused as to, to why and I think as a recruiter sometimes it doesn't matter whether you did it or didn't you're a recruiter and some people will always think that you're going to try. So they will automatically blame you when something hasn't happened. Yeah. So um, that really hurt me actually. And 
And things like when I give someone my word, like if I give my husband my marriage, you know, anyone questioning my integrity or honesty towards that, I think would probably be mm. something I'm scared of because who are we if we haven't got truth, right? Yeah, that's a good one. It took a lot of courage for you to share that. It took a lot of courage. <laughs> <laughs> it did. It awesome. Did. Well, this was another fun, um, hopefully insightful episode for deep. our deep. deep, another deep episode. Um, for our listeners. Thank you so much to our listeners for listening to this show. The Women Your Mother Warned You About brought to you by Sales Gravy. Again, go check out salesgravy.university to level up your game. And hey, winter is coming and you need to be a squirrel. And if you don't know what I mean, you probably should pick up Jeb Blunt's newest book, Selling in a Crisis. Go check out uh, our our websites and all the places, uh, womenyourmotherwarnsyoubout.com, salesgravy.com, salesgravy.university. Uh, and, and I'm out of here. Susanna, final words from you. I'm also out of here with courage and kindness. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't even get to talk about kindness. Let's do that on the next show. We, yeah, I should get me shared. Okay. Tune in. I think kindness is a good one to talk about too. All right, we're out of here. Bye.